going to see a lot of offers come offline over the next five, 10 years with everything going on. And I don't think you're going to see a lot of new construction of office, especially. And so I think as people return to the office and companies start to grow again, we're going to see a supply demand potential situation here. So obviously, again, you got to buy it right and own in the right places. But I do think over time, it'll be a good buy. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owners Association, where real estate investors have found success since 1968. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 449. There seems to be a lot of fear in the commercial real real estate world about the amount of distress in commercial office buildings. In San Francisco, a Market Street tower that was purchased for $62 million in 2016 was recently sold for $6.6 million. That's a 90% haircut. But where many people see distress and ruin, my guest today sees opportunity. Scott Sherman of Toros Equities is actively acquiring office buildings and retail spaces at a time when many are hesitant to do so. Scott is here today to discuss his strategy for identifying, buying, and financing distressed trophy assets in the office and retail space in high entry barrier markets such as Miami, Tampa, and other U.S. cities. Scott, welcome to the show. Hey, Brian, thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got started investing in real estate. I started my career, I guess, about 20 years ago up in New York City and moved up to New York after college. And I'm actually a CPA by background. So I started my career at Ernst & Young in the real estate group, but always kind of had a, more of an interest and desire to be in the real estate world and in the accounting world. But it was a great background and foundation to have in really any business career. So I did that for a few years, then kind of jumped out of that to a family office where I was kind of focusing on their real estate investments and then moved over to a fund in New York City called Thor Equities, where I, I really cut my teeth for about seven years before going off on my own and starting uh, my first company, Tricera Capital, and now Toros Equities. And so I'd say, look, at Thor is probably where I got my real kind of training on a little bit of the retail and, and office and mixed-use worlds, and also on being a little bit of a contrarian investor in certain ways. But that kind of brings me to where we are today with Toros and kind of our focus on retail office and kind of value-add mixed-use investments. Tell us what you see going on right now in the office and retail world that is scaring a lot of investors? I think we got to t separate office and retail today. Because I, I actually think they've kind of crisscrossed and kind of how people have viewed them over the last you know five to 10 years. So you know, retail has now become a favorable asset class. People are seeing value in it. It's actually, I think, tough to, to buy retail today because it's definitely heavily sought after. Whereas 10 years ago, it was kind of that same fear, concern. People thought retail was going away, which we could touch on you know, later. And now office kind of fast forwarding, everyone's kind of scared of office. There's a lot of distress. There's a lot of uncertainty. And I think, you know, as a result of that, there's a lack of capital debt and equity really out there to do office transactions today, just creating major kind of correction in values. And, and part of that's warranted and part of it's not. I mean, I think there's some macro, you know, obviously coming out of COVID, there was the whole work from home movement which I'm not a big believer in. I think look, there's some things that maybe can be done remotely, but I think in general, and you know, I think we're seeing it every day with new articles coming out, but I think work from home is going to be short-lived. Maybe companies go to more of a flexible four-day-a-week in the office kind of structure, but you need to be in the office. I think to mentor the young next generation of professionals, it's very important to them for their growth to kind of learn and see from their you know, superiors. And I also think from a culture and kind of just productivity perspective, work from home, I, I think it's just not going to have that same effect. And so I think it's every day it's changing. There's more articles coming out. But right now, there's definitely still a very high level fear and kind of uncertainty as to what does office look like? What is it going to look like in the future? And how does that all kind of fit together? On top of that, it's not just more people are choosing to work from home. There has been some return to office, but not 100% like it was before COVID. But there's also the financial and the, the lending side to office too. You have a lot of office loans that are coming due either this year or next. Can you talk about that and how office is being perceived by the lenders right now? Office is a four-letter word to lenders right now. They are 
trying to unload where they can and they're trying to not take on new office risk if they don't have to, right? So it's kind of a, in a way, it's almost like a, a death spiral because you have, you know, loans maturing, and but those same lenders who are looking to get paid off and get refinanced out don't want to put out new money to office, right? So it's like the lenders don't want to finance it. So, so they're kind of stuck. So a lot of lenders are, are kind of stuck in this kind of situation where one of two things is going to happen, right? If there's not a deep market and a lot of liquidity for office values are down, they're either going to have to sell these at a loss or they're going to have to work with the borrowers to restructure, extend, and you know, work with them to ultimately kind of fight through this and hopefully get through to the other side of when you know liquidity starts to return to the market. So I think you're seeing a little of both depending on the lender. I think it's a case-by-case situation. So I think it depends on the lender and the borrower. You know, if a borrower is showing a willingness and desire to fight through it and work with the lender, I think now, you know, lenders and office owners are partners in certain ways in figuring it out. And, you know, in some cases, if it's either just the lender thinks it's a bad partner or, or, or certain other high-level things are, are are concerning them, they may not be willing to work with the borrower. But in those cases, they're most likely to either have to own an office building themselves or sell it at a, at a loss. So we're seeing a little of everything right now. And it's kind of every day, it's, it's, there's kind of some new things happening. So it's not like this playbook's been fully written yet. What specifically are you seeing right now? I mean, what you're talking about, what you just answered in your, your the previous question is sort of what the prevailing thought is on lender side. But what are you seeing specifically in your world and, and those that you know personally, like what are you seeing happen on the ground? I think we're seeing a little of everything, right? I mean, look, we're we're having our share, you know, fortunately not a lot, but, you know, we're working through a couple of loan restructurings on a couple of legacy office deals right now as well, where it's actually been very well received by the lender and we're working hand in hand with them. I'm working finding a path through it, like I alluded to. But, you know, on, on the buy side, we're seeing a few things, right? If, if there's office buildings on the market, really, there's got to be a real deep discount or some form of distress really to get exciting today, especially for our equity investors, right? They want to see some sort of distress or story to it. And so most buildings that are on the market are usually being kind of steered by the lender. And, and again, being sold at a loss, not, not only is the equity being wiped out, but the lender selling at a loss. So we're seeing some deep value like that. And in certain instances where we are, you know, pursuing some new acquisitions on that front. We're also seeing some opportunities now with lenders who don't want to deal with all the hair potentially foreclosing or working through it. And so they're actually just trying to sell their notes. So we're looking at some note acquisitions, we're looking at some, you know, straight office buys, but really through the lender. And then we're also seeing some recap opportunities where some operators are trying to figure out if there's a way to fill that gap on the refi and bring in some fresh equity. And so we're, you know, selectively looking at all, all the above, but we're trying to pick our spots, you know, very carefully and, you know, where we believe we can execute and where there's really value to it. And what is your spot? I, I, I know in the intro, we said trophy assets in Miami and some other really uh, good markets, but what, what specifically are you looking at and where do you invest when it comes to office? So, you know, we're based in Miami and, and our, our real focus as a company has been the Southeast U.S., And and predominantly, it's Florida. And I'd say right now, we're very fortunate to be in Miami and in Florida, which I think fundamentally is one of the strongest states for office right now. So we don't really have to go too far geographically to to find opportunities. So we're really, I'd say, Palm Beach down to Miami on the East Coast, Tampa down to Naples on the West Coast. It's kind of where we're you know mostly focused. We did an office deal in in the last year. We bought an office building here in Miami, one in Tampa, and we also did one up in Atlanta. And so we'll look in Atlanta. We'll look in the Carolinas as well. We have some, you know, we're involved in a property up in Tennessee and Nashville. So Southeast U.S. mostly. Now, I know you you gave an example of that office deal in, in San Francisco. I think, look, in San Fran, Chicago, a lot of cities, New York City included, there's a lot of distress right now and a lot of deep, you know, at least optically look like really deep discounts. We're not really focused or chasing those types of deals right now. I'm, I'm really trying to be disciplined geographically, but also we're trying to buy office where we believe the office is still going to thrive, where we still see fundamentals either stabilizing or actually getting better. You know, here in South Florida, we actually have improving fundamentals and values are going down. So to me, it's a very interesting kind of disconnect. And so, you know, we, we are being pretty selective. We're not looking at office to convert. You know, a lot of people talk about office conversions, hotel and residential. That's not our game. We're, we're looking to buy the right office in the right locations that we think will continue to be office and thrive as office for the long term. What's your target there? Like size, price, where are you really dialing in uh, to find the office opportunities? We're definitely more kind of entrepreneurial in that regard. So we'll do, you know, a $10 million to a $100 million type deal. We can even do bigger if the opportunity came, but I'd say in that range is probably our sweet spot. 
And so, you know, we're just trying to find the right structure, the right opportunities and ways to come in at a basis that makes sense. So square foot wise, what, what are you looking at? And you use the term trophy asset. So what makes it a trophy asset and how many square foot do you usually go after? Trophy is maybe not necessarily a, a, a perfect word to use because I'd say, look, we're not only focused on what, what, you know, what is trophy, but I mean, like the best building in the market, I, I guess what I would maybe call trophy, but I think we're looking at just good quality buildings. And it doesn't necessarily have to be what I call trophy. If it's a the best B building in a market where we see very tight supply, you know, we'd look at that too. Size wise, again, it really varies. It's more dollar range because I mean, there's some boutique builders we'll look at that maybe are 50,000 feet, but then, you know, we bought it off this building that was, you know, 250,000 square feet in late 23. And so, you know, we'll kind of look at different sizes. Really, we're kind of open to whatever makes sense. There's no real parameter on size. One of the things I've heard about office is that it's the improve the newer office or the office that has a lot of amenities for workers is, is actually doing quite well. It's more of the B type office. It's not. So do you have like a value add strategy when you buy these distressed office buildings? Like what do you do to actually attract new tenants? It's really case by case, but I think you brought up something, right? I think that what the people are calling the class double A, the new best products in every market are still thriving and you're seeing that Everyone's calling flight to quality. And that's where I think institutional capital still has an appetite. You know, I think when you start looking at like more of the A minus, the older A product, and then the B plus type product, which is more of the space I like to play in where there's a little bit more deep value, you have to differentiate yourself. So you either got to buy in markets where there's tight supply or how do you differentiate? You know, so, you know, my background was more in retail before I kind of was doing office. And so I like to look at office as more of a from the ground up kind of story. I think when you walk in the lobby, your first impression, your feeling of how you come to a building and how it communicates with you is extremely important to that experience. And I think today, more than ever, employers are looking for reasons to get their employees back into the office. So the better the building, the more amenities, the more the space feels or, or the location is amenitized by being in a good urban location. I think all that stuff is very much relevant today. And so we're always looking at how can we put some money, can we bring some more retail and energy to the ground floor, put some concepts in a cool coffee shop, or maybe it's just doing some cosmetic upgrades as well. And so we'll look at each deal and kind of determine what that is. But I think you're, you know, not all, you know, you got to be very careful in that space because one thing we're not chasing is, you know, there's a lot of that, com- what I call commodity suburban class B, class C office where, you know, there's every building's the same. They're all just kind of very generic. You walk in, it's almost depressing to walk in these buildings. It's just kind of this back office feeling. And, and that stuff scares me. I think that I'm not playing that game right now. And I think that game is scary because you have so much of that same product everywhere with a lot of vacancy and, and you're really just playing a, a rate game. So for the tenants that are there, you're just competing with everyone else. Who's going to, who, you know, basically whoever wins loses because you're just charging the lowest rent, right? So that's a very tough game. And I think a lot of that office might, you know, over time is going to go away. And then the ones that stay will, will do well. But it's a little bit of just a, a scary game there. We want to go in markets where it's a little bit more supply constrained. And, and that's why, again, Florida, we're seeing that, you know, just across the board. And just in general, I mean, that's a little bit of our kind of our macro thesis, right? We're taking this contrarian approach. I was buying retail, you know, 10 years ago when everyone thought retail was going away. It was a retail apocalypse. Everything was going online. You fast forward 10 years, like I mentioned earlier, right? retail is desirable now. Not only that, but you're seeing all the online brands. They're actually looking for brick and mortar stores. So it actually went the other way. And over this last 10 years, you've seen very little new supply of retail, real retail come online. And in fact, you've seen some retail get, get removed from over the last 10 years. And so you're seeing very little growth of supply. And now you're seeing the rent and demand of retail really increasing. I, I think in some level, we're going to see something similar with office. I, I really think in 10 years from now, we're going to be under office. And maybe that's not, you know, that doesn't hold for every little sub-market or city. But in general, you're going to see a lot of office come offline over the next five, 10 years with everything going on. And I don't think you're going to see a lot of new construction of office, especially. And so I think as people return to the office and companies start to grow again, we're going to see a supply-demand potential situation here. So obviously, again, you got to buy it right and own in the right places. But I do think over time, it'll be a good buy. Can you take us through a specific example uh, of you ta- uh, buying a distressed office property, doing some value add, and, and then you know finding success at the other end of that? In the middle of COVID 2020, here in Miami, in a neighborhood called Wynwood, we actually bought out of distress from the lender an office building that was completely vacant. Well, it was vacant except for one tenant. The tenant was Spaces, which is uh, like the Regis, the co-working. And they were in bankruptcy. So we basically, our only tenant was, was, was in the middle of BK. So we didn't even know if they were going to stay or what that was going to look like. And we're buying a vacant office building in the middle of COVID when everyone was, you know, still working, you know, like not even allowed to go to the office, right? This is that before the work from home even idea came about. 
but we just knew it was just built. It was a new building. We, we liked the basis and we were able to find some debt and, and capitalize it. We bought it for you know really well. And I'd say within 18 months, we were able to fully lease the building up, stabilize it and exit it and over a three multiple, you know, and, and really, you know, it was a perfect example of, you know, no one was buying vacant office in 2020. We believed in that market, believed in the area. I think we got lucky in the timing in that, you know, everything kind of slung shot out of COVID really heavy and really fast. I don't think anyone saw it. I, I, I wish I could say I saw that coming, but I don't think anyone did. But we definitely capitalized on momentum quickly. And we were able to exit and make a good return. And so I think there's definitely those contrarian bets out there. You just got to, you know, the other piece of the puzzle is it's just very hard to get them capitalized. So debt and equity, you know, convincing equity right now to invest in office. I mean, you wake up every day and just read the papers. It's not rosy, right? So like institutional capital specifically is, is mostly on the sidelines for it. And, and you talk to these guys, and they're like, look, I can't go into my committee and pitch an office building today. Like they're going to throw me out of the room. So, and, and, and the guys that, that do believe in it are saying, well, even if I did want to pitch it, you know, we, you know, we answer to our investors. So these funds are saying our investors think are crazy if we tell them we're putting our money in office. So, so the institutional capital for the most part has been kind of stuck and on the office front. So it really, fortunately for us, we, we have a lot of kind of high net worth family office type capital that we typically invest with. And, and that capital has been a little bit more willing to lean in with us and kind of buy into our thesis. Still challenging, but I think that's really, we've been fortunate to get these deals done because we've been relying more on kind of that private capital, not institutional capital. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is health care for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole health care insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best health care options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at RCB Associates, LLC.com. The ultra high net worth family offices that you're working with, are they providing both the equity and the, the debt or are you finding debt from some of the traditional sources still? No, the debt we're going more traditional, local, regional banks. It's definitely lower leverage and it's definitely requiring some form of personal guarantees. But, you know, for, for the right structure, you know, if we're buying a, you know, an office building at, you know, 30, 40 percent of what it was worth a few years ago, and then we're doing a 50 percent leverage loan, so much lower leverage. You know, we're not, you know, we can get comfortable with some form of guarantees, recourse on these, but really that's the only way to get them done today. You can get a bank to look at it. Otherwise, you're going with more of the private debt fund type capital, which is very expensive. You're looking at, you know, double digit type interest rates. We're trying to avoid that because we don't want to choke ourselves. We really want to buy these things well, lower cost of capital, and really just be able to cash flow and, and kind of ride through the next two, three, four years as we don't know exactly when you know, and how quickly things are going to recover. Well, what's your leasing strategy? When you buy a distressed office building and it's vacant, how do you lease it up? What, how do you convince new tenants to come in? You got to put the right team. So I mean, part of it is getting the right local leasing team to kind of help you with that process. Is There's a marketing and branding story. And then also, like I said, it, you know, if you're going to put capital in, putting a renovation plan together, amenity plan together that you can really implement and also kind of sell to the potential tenants to get them to come in. But I think the other big piece is if you're buying an office building today, you're probably buying it at a basis below where most of the competitive buildings are because you're buying at this kind of reset value. So in those circumstances where we're buying, we're also able to win on rent all day long because we're paying, you know, 150 a foot and all of our competitive buildings, you know, are into it for 250 a foot. We can do a deal, you know, significantly lower than them and still make money. So we have that other kind of ace up our sleeve, which is we don't want to drop rents. We'd rather try to 
can get the highest rent possible, but we can win all day long on rent. If our basis is, you know, 30, 40% below our competitors. In five years, you know, are you locked into lower rents? Then the value suffers because of it. I mean, how do you maintain a balance between getting those the space leased, but not shorting yourself later on when it comes to the valuation? We're not looking to play the low rent game. So we're not, that's never, our business plan is never going in and we're just going to charge lower rents. Our business plan is we, we're buying this building because we think it's well located, it's differentiated. We can invest capital and, and, and lease it up that way going head to head with our competitive buildings, which is what we're doing. Like the building we just bought in, in August in Coral Gables, we actually are, are pushing rents. We're raising rents, not lowering rents. So we've actually, you know, pushed rent since we we bought it, not the inverse. You know, I was just using that as an example, which is, you know, in the instance that we do need to, to get some big leases done, if we need to lower the, you know, the rent a dollar or two a foot to kind of win the deal versus someone else, we have that in our chamber, but we're not trying to, we don't want to short ourselves either. So look, if we're doing a short-term lease, you know, under five years, it's probably easier to do. If you're doing a 10-year lease, yeah, you don't want to you know, sell yourself short and then you're locking in the value. So you're right. So let's talk about retail. You're also doing that and that's in a much different spot. And I'll kind of repeat a little bit of what you said, but yeah, you're right. 10 years ago, retail was on its way out because Amazon was going to kill all the brick and mortar retail places. But the opposite has happened. How are you taking advantage of that dynamic? We're still actively trying to find some good urban, you know, urban retail type properties throughout Florida. We're actively acquiring a retail building right now in St. Pete near Tampa. And we're also working on something here in Miami as well. So we're still active on the retail front. It's been, like I said, it's tougher to find value today because there's a lot of capital still chasing it. But we're seeing the opportunities in kind of that urban street retail type space we like. But yeah, it's definitely it was much easier five, six, seven, eight years ago when there were less people kind of focused or really attracted to it. But today I say the inverse, right? We're if we have a retail deal and we go to our investors, it's much easier to get that capitalized than it is office, right? Everyone still kind of likes retail and can get behind it much easier than the office story. So it's it's a much harder sell to get our investors to come to office than it is retail. And so we're trying to find the balance and do both. But I definitely find I think there's deeper value and higher returns in office today, if you can find the right deals versus retail. I'm guessing that some of our listeners might be a little confused about what we're saying about retail because the I still in the media and, and the prevailing thought out there, it has some sense of dread about retail, like it is in trouble. But can you explain a little bit about what the reality is with retail? Like why, di- why is retail doing as well as it is right now? I think it goes back to a little bit of what I mentioned, which is there's been very little supply, new supply of, re- of retail over the last decade. So you've got growing demand. So vacancies, I think historically, at its lowest rate on a national level for retail, I think it's been in, I think, close to a decade. So you've got you know very low vacancy rate nationally. You're seeing rents continue to go up. And retail sales have been very strong. I think we're actually getting to a, uh, just because I read a lot and kind of keep a pulse on a lot of what's going on. It looks like we might be hitting that inflection point where some tenants are starting to struggle again. I think rents maybe got ahead of themselves in some markets and some tenants are starting to choke a little bit. But in general, tenants are doing well. Sales volumes are strong. They're justifying the rents and the occupancy. And we're seeing a lot of growth. I just got back from ICFC in Las Vegas, which is a big national retail conference. And there was very positive. All the national retailers and reps that were there, they're all looking for new space or looking to grow. And to be honest, a lot of them, a lot of these companies that are looking to grow they're struggling to grow because they can't find real estate. They can't find spaces to get into. So, you know, there really is, I think, at least in, in, in good areas, good pockets, almost like a shortage of supply, which is, which is, which is a good thing if you're owning retail. Why didn't Amazon kill off the retail like everyone thought it was going, going to happen? I mean, how, how is it that retail is, is doing so well when you can just order something on Amazon and have it delivered the same day? The key word is really experience. You, there's, you, you, you can't get that experience online. So yes, if you just need to get your, your a good, a generic something, you can order online. We all do it, you know, myself included. But I think experiential retail is really the key now. And you're seeing a lot of that. I mean, there's certain things you can't do online, right? You can't go to dinner or get a coffee with your friends online. You can't go to the movies with your friends online. You can't go to the gym and work out with your friends online. So there's a lot of these other types of retail out there that, that really can't get replaced in a way. And those have been thriving and growing. It's boutique retail concepts, restaurants, food and beverage, and then entertainment uses, right? You're seeing these pickleball, indoor pickleball concepts now and all different things, right? So I think a lot of that's where the growth has been, more on the experiential. And then for more of your traditional soft goods, dry retail, they've all been kind of re-gearing 
their their bricks and mortar locations over the last ten years. You know, they're either changing their store, store format size. So some of them maybe who were in fifteen thousand square feet are now saying, you know what, we can you know we're going to downsize to five thousand square feet is our new concept, right? So they're, they're doing smaller concepts. And they're also, again, trying to incorporate more technology to enhance the experience when you walk in the store. So, you know, like I know Nike's done this and a few other brands where you go in and there's a lot more technology and things to incorporate into your experience when you go in and how you buy, how you shop, you know, and I think that's going to continue to evolve. And with all this AI and everything going on, again, I think the in-store experience and creating more of a brand identity is where you're seeing the growth and why I think Amazon hasn't really been able to replace all of retail yet. So I'm hearing what you're saying about retail. It's, it's harder for you now to find the types of deals that you're looking for, but what are you looking for? And what is your retail strategy currently? We're value add guys. What does that mean? We, we either want to buy in buildings, you know, retail properties with, you know, either a lot of vacancy so we can take that lease of risk where we believe we can kind of unlock the value, or maybe it's just a lot of old tenants with low, you know, below market rents and over time we're going to rework and kind of push rents. Or it could just be an area where we really just believe it's on the calm. We think there's a lot of potential growth and upside in kind of the market. And we want to just kind of, you know, buy into that long term. So it, it varies, but look for us, it's it's definitely more of a value add approach. Like if we're not just going to compete with the a re to buy a stabilized, you know, for shop your know, grocery anchor shopping center like that's just not our mo because we're not just looking to buy a you know a six cap and sit on it we want to create value and unlock it over you know a period of time and, and generate returns for our investors is there anything i haven't asked you about either that that i should be asking you probably but i you know i think we've i think you've covered a lot today this has actually really enjoyed this so far i mean look we're always kind of looking for that next opportunity that next kind of angle we like like i said we like to be a little contrarian my you know my favorite quote from warren buffett is be greedy when people are fearful and fearful when people are greedy and i think that right now office kind of fits that retail used to fit that a little bit more but yeah we're just trying to find angles where we think there's a dislocation of value and take advantage of where we can how would people find out more about you get a hold of you find out about some of your opportunities obviously our website www.toros t o r O S E equities, E Q U I T I E S. You're welcome to go on there. You're also welcome to email me, Scott at Toros equities.com. If anyone has any opportunities they want to reach out to me on, I'm, I'd love to discuss. We're actively looking for new deals and we're also always looking for good investors. So if anyone has any interest or appetite in, in what we do, feel free to reach out as well. I'm happy to set up a call and talk about what we're up to. What is your favorite hack or app? Probably right now, unfortunately, I'd say definitely Instagram is is an app that I probably find myself on a lot when I have some downtime uh, at home more than I should. It's always yeah, fun or you can get lost in that real loophole, but there's probably better productivity apps out there than Instagram. Do you use Instagram in your investing in business? Yes, and I'll follow a lot of new concepts, brands, and things, and that helps me kind of get some insight into things going on. So I say a little bit, but no, I say for the most part, it's probably just a waste of time. Thanks for coming on the show today and, and talking about office and retail. And just really, you know, like having this conversation about office, which really is sort of the the distressed asset class that everyone's pointing to right now. And the fact that you're finding ways to find opportunity in that asset class, really interesting, really impressive. Thank you so much for coming on the show today to share your experiences with us. I appreciate it. Thanks again for having me. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com.